uh, today we are with Mr. Nitin sir. He will be guiding you guys uh, through aerodynamics module. So, hi Nitin sir, good evening. And good evening, good evening sir, good evening everyone. Yeah, so you can <laughs> start sir. Sure sir, thank you. Uh, so, um, hey everyone, um, I, as Dinesh so introduced, I'm Nitin Somashikaran. Uh, so I just to give a background of myself, I've been with the IGC uh, team for let's say around um, around two to three, uh, maybe three years now. Um, and I've been teaching aerodynamics, fluid mechanics and stability there. And uh, and by background, um, I did my master's in aerospace engineering from uh, Indian Institute of Science. So I passed out in 2019 and after which I joined uh, Exxon Mobil, which is an oil and gas company, uh, as a computational scientist, uh, where I mainly work on CFD-related problems and all many other computational uh, problems. Uh, so, developing numerical algorithms, implementing them uh, in, let's say, in C++, developing you know, flow solvers, um, etc., or optimization modules, um, things like that. Uh, so, yeah, that's um, in our background about me. Um, so let me show you guys what we are planning to. Um, and and I, I see some familiar names uh, who took took my courses for the gate part. Um, yeah, and and yeah, so so since this is very very much a specialized um, for the HAL uh, test, so uh, we have a number of things to cover um, with very little time. Um, so. I'll try my level best to cover everything in uh, as detail as possible with giving you guys a good understanding. But at the same time, you guys also need to work with me uh, to to let me know if there are some things which you guys are finding it difficult to understand. Ask questions. Ask 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 whatever you want. The floor is completely open. Ask me anytime. Um, and it's all right. And so in this course, we'll be covering um, both fluid mechanics and aerodynamics, and we have around 20 hours allotted for that. Um, so uh, the fluid mechanics portion, if I go over, so we have the fluid properties, uh, the static, uh, uh, like the density viscosity, we'll just go over a quick recap of all those fluid statics, um, especially um, just like the name suggests, what what can we, anal what, how can we analyze a fluid which is not in motion? And then fluid kinematics, uh, so what can we do if the fluid is in motion? And then the governing equations uh, like the continuity equation, momentum equation, and things like that. Then we'll go uh, a little bit into detail about the viscous flows, uh, which are nothing but the boundary layer theory, the flow inside a channel, flow inside a um, pipe, etc. And then um, after that, uh, uh, I'll wrap up the fluid mechanics lectures with the dimension analysis, which is a very small topic, but but uh, um, uh, you know very relevant. Mm, and then and 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 I'm expecting um, around eight hours for this uh, part for, uh, to be completed, and including question and answers, we'll be solving some questions on the class, and mm, and and of course the 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 the, uh, uh, the the time allotted to clear your question, you uh, the questions that you guys might have as well. Uh, so that is for the fluid mechanics, and for the aerodynamics part, mm, uh, I'll be covering potential flow concepts. Uh, like so saying flow over a cylinder flow over a ranky novel things like that uh, then i will move on to um, thin foil theory which is which again is a part of uh, potential flow concepts but just to deal with it separately um and then the lifting line theory or the 3d wing theory and 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 uh, to cap off things to talk a little bit about the experimental techniques um that we're presently using and then uh, and nothing much to detail and uh, in from the experimental techniques point of view but just to give you guys an idea and and i'm expecting uh, this to be covered in an around 12 hours of uh, class time including um, our question and answer solutions as well all right uh, so this is my plan for fluid mechanics and aerodynamics so anybody any anybody has any question over here anybody wants to clear anything before we jump in All right, uh, so if there are no questions, uh, do we cover compressible flows? Uh, no, that will be covered separately, uh, right, Dinesh, sir? Uh, the gas dynamics concepts? 
Mm, or I, I, I don't know if that would be relevant for this particular test, but yeah, it, we, I, do, I, will, I will not be covering it, but maybe another faculty will be taking it. All right. Okay, so, so in the complex potential functions like transfer, uh, no, 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 we won't be going into uh, com complex transformations uh, just because of the fact that it's not required. We can analyze them in much simpler sense. Um, we'll be taking a complex transformations are one way of approaching the potential flow concept, but we, we, we can take a, a route which is much simpler uh, math. I mean, which is much simpler to understand um, uh, and which is which uh, which uh, which which is just, just sufficient for our uh, whatever we are aiming at. Uh, so I won't be. I will be taking the partnership concept, but not going into the complex transformations. All right. Any any other question? Simple will be covered with thermal and propulsion, but yeah. All right. Okay, uh, so let me continue here. Um, so if there are no questions, uh, let me move ahead. Um, okay, so first we'll kick off with the fluid mechanics part, um, and and um, uh, I will be going over some of the concepts that I mentioned uh, beforehand. Uh, so let's uh, take things step by step. And the, uh, you know, uh, so just like Dinesh mentioned, there's a small issue with the uh, with the presenter thing. So some of my slide portion, which is on the left and the right, are being chopped off. But yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take it off it from the from the next time onwards. Um, uh, yeah. So let me begin over here and let me see if I can bring up my annotation. Mm. Uh, so please tell me guys if you're able to see my drawing on the screen, uh, the line which I drew just now, is it visible to everyone? Yes, sir. All right, thanks. Uh, so let's start with, uh, the properties of fluid. Uh, um, uh, so the properties that I'm talking about mainly what we're looking at is density and viscosity and, and a lot more to come, but, but density and viscosity, uh, if you look at the other most uh, the, the most important ones when you look at look at a fluid problem um, head on. Mm, so what is again uh, density? It's, it's very simple definition and you guys would have heard of it a thousand times. It's nothing but mass per unit volume. And that is true that and this definition of density of let's say you have a body. Um, let's say you're trying to find the density of steel. Let's take a solid example first. You, you take the steel mass and then you find the mass of it, you find the volume of it, and then uh, voila, you get the density. Uh, and, 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 and this works from a very solid, a rigid body perspective, but it does not work from a fluid dynamics perspective because uh, in our case, uh, we are talking about fluid, mm, anything which can flow. Uh, that you know, it's it's nothing rigid. Uh, the molecules are so loosely packed that these molecules can easily flow off. So this definition straight away does not hold, but it holds. All right. So in our case, our definition needs to be a bit more refined. So refined in the sense is that let's say you have you need you have you have you have taken water in a container as shown in the figure, right? And you are an experimentalist trying to characterize what is the density of this water. So what do you do? Uh, one way is, is that you take this entire thing and then put it, find the mass, find the volume, blah, blah. But that is not the scientific method to deal with fluids. The real way to deal with fluids is take some small volumes. Let's say volume one, volume two, volume three, and one, two, three can be different or same or uh, whatever. You take volume one and then you find the mass of this volume uh, one. Uh, so I find the mass of volume one as delta M one. All right. And then I uh, find the vol uh, volume of this particular volume I took. Uh, let me call it delta V2. All right. Now, now I do this and then I get what is called as rho 1. Okay, some density I get, some density. Let's say for water, it's around 1000 kg per meter cube. 
Mm-hmm. And and uh, I'm I'm sure you guys will be familiar with the units of density that is kg per meter cube or slugs per feet cube, uh, SI units, and this is nothing but the British uh, uh, units. And BGS units are and and funny funny thing is that the BGS units are not even used by Britishers; they are being used by Americans uh, for some reason. Um, uh, yeah, so. You have you found you found row one. Next thing is that you take another another sample of fluid of uh, volume V two um, uh, V two for that matter. Okay, uh, so I'm going to characterize my density uh, row two as nothing but uh, uh, delta um, delta m two divide delta m two divided by delta V two. All right. Uh, so excuse me for the writing and finding somehow finding it very difficult to do it in uh, the webex uh, but let's say once we start once we start using our igc tool it'll be quite straightforward um so I'll, I'll, as we go on i'll try to uh, correct it uh, so i find uh, i take this new sample and then i um, i uh, characterize the the density as row 2 and what do you guys think? Uh, will row one be exactly equal to row two, or uh, do you guys think? And and there's no guarantee that my v one and v two are exactly the same, right? Uh, so what do you guys think? Um, whether my row one and row two are they going to be the same? Oh, like don't be same, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry. You don't be same, sir. Yeah. Exactly. So it may not be really same. It may not be that same. You know, you might get thousand over here. You might get maybe nine, nine, nine over here. Uh, but that is not something which we would be that concerned about, right? Like a one kg per meter cube change. You know, that's basically nothing. So uh, and and you and what you do is that you take a number of samples like this, take thousands of them, and then you take a statistical average, and that is finally you call as a call as a density of the fluid, and that's how typically they characterize the density uh, anywhere in the world. Now. How is this taking the small volume relevant over here? That's the real question, right? So let me take you to the graph here. So this graph is nothing but, um, uh, you know, it's a uh, density on the y axis and the sampling volume that is my delta v on my x axis. All right. Now, what this, what this graph tells me is that if I start with a very, very small volume, a really small, close to zero, I can see that as my as I increase and then so initially let's say I'm taking a very small volume then I keep increasing this volume uh, from zero to maybe uh, one meter cube or thousand meter cube I do not really worry about that now what I see is that the density so let's say you do it for a solid uh, this graph will basically look flat just like this but for a fluid you know that's not the case depend depending upon how much volume you take your density can have fluctuations as you see from the graph so as you see from the graph uh, at very low volumes when you take very low volume of this matter you see that the density is fluctuating right it's going up then it goes down blah blah things like that till a point of your sampling volume let me call this delta uh, v l lower bound or something like that for that matter now then i keep taking more and more uh, larger larger volumes of the sample and then i keep going on then i reach a point let me call this delta v r all right i call this delta v r and from and and within this range of delta v l to delta v r i see that you know irrespective of how much if if this delta v l is 1000 and this with this is 2000 as long as i'm taking the sample volume to be around 1000 and 2000 i do not see much change in my density which i'm calculating right experimentally now beyond delta v r i'm seeing that my density is again increasing which is again an inconsistent inconsistency so now the way we characterize density is that we we, we make sure that uh, you know let's say someone is trying to characterize the density of oil water or whatever they do this exercise they increase the sampling volume initially they take 0 0.01 meter cube then they take 0 0.1 meter cube as, and then they go on and then try to get this graph and then they try to find the sweet spot the region of sampling volume where your density more or less remains constant um, and there could be very very minimal differences but that is not something which we would be concerned with now and then uh, the the person who's sampling it or characterizing it would take a statistical average over here uh, between these 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 regions and that is the that is what i call i call my uh, density of my fluid rho f and 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 one thing which you guys need to keep in mind is that you know this is so the way they do it is not really uh, concerning 
but why they do it in this way or uh, the reason why uh, you see some fluctuations uh, right uh, at the lower part and the higher part uh, you see a lot of fluctuations and and the reason is very you know interesting um so as you take very low volumes uh, you see that at very low volumes there are going to be that many minimal number of uh, molecules as well um in your in your system uh, so when you have these very few molecules in your system that you're taking in there can be a lot of statistical inconsistency that there could be a more concentration of molecules towards one side of the system than the other and that could really mess things up so that's why you see these fluctuations over here and while in the higher region uh, when you take very very large volumes of fluid what you see there is that you can typically expect uh, some aggregation of these fluids in certain parts. So in certain parts, there will be more, certain parts, there will be less. Uh, the fluid will aggregate uh, because of the sheer quantity of how much it is there. And it again gives you some inconsistencies. So this is our sweet spot. And this is the region that you want to look into of the sampling volume that we take to characterize the density of a fluid. So Again, you, you do not take the entire container, you take very, very small samples, and then you characterize the density, and um, that's how you find the density of a fluid. And again, this density is, is a function of temperature, it can change with pressure, uh, things like that, and we'll, we'll come to that. It can change with uh, amount of particles you're putting in. Let's say you mix salt with water, definitely your density, is, density will increase, right? So that is something, um, it's an entirely different thing which uh, may not be that relevant. And some of the other parameters that I want you guys to know is nothing but the specific weight. That is nothing but rho times g, uh, and uh, you know just just a shorthand notation basically. And then the specific gravity is nothing but uh, the density of a fluid uh, with respect to some reference density. And usually this reference density is density of water. And density of water is very, uh, you know, it's such a, um, uh, it's close to like thousand, right? So it's very convenient to express the density of anything else with respect to uh, this thousand guy. So that is why usually they take the reference density as density of water, but uh, in different settings, it could be different. Maybe some industry takes some other fluid as uh, the reference and things like that. So, uh, so that is specific gravity, um, uh, guys. Uh, so any questions on uh, how we characterize density and what density is exactly here from a fluid perspective? Any questions? Uh, sir, uh, why yeah. uh, density increases as we increase the volume? Uh, yeah, so uh, so, so again, you need not consider it as an increase in density. So that just this graph says it could it could well be going in a downward path as well. Uh, so the 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 idea here is not it's not that it's it either increases or decreases. It's just that anywhere you go b beyond that, you'll get, get some inconsistency. That inconsistency could be that your trend might be increasing or your trend might be decreasing, which can differ from fluid to fluid basically. And for some cases, um, uh, let's say as I told you, there could be some aggregations uh, um, uh, you know of particles here and there or aggregation of aggregation of fluid uh, here and there and that can really cause this change and this change this this could go up it could go down it, it depends on a lot of things it could be it could depend upon the way a person is conducting the experiment the apparatus that they're using the fluid that they're using um, things like that um, yeah so just just the inconsistency is the main concept over here All right. Yes, sir. Any other question? If anybody's posting something on the chat, uh, it, it might at times I might miss it because I just I don't see the entire chat window. I just see those, uh, uh, you know, the, those uh, words coming in in between on the right side of my screen. So in case I miss your question on chat, please uh, feel free to ask it again, either through voice, uh, you know, just in case if I miss it. All right, so let me move to viscosity. So viscosity is another property basically tells you, you know, how much resistance that a particular fluid has in, in, in motion. That is just like how we humans have what they call as inertia, right? Uh, we have inertia towards uh, motion. Um, uh, let's say uh, when we are moving, we do not want to stop. Or when we are at rest, we do not want to move. Similarly, fluids do have it. And 
so in 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 case of human beings or in case of real objects uh, for that matter um, uh, you know let's say a human being of um, you know so and so uh, let's say a person or let's say you're moving a block of uh, steel or block of ice um we say that uh, you know if if the, if the particular if the particular solid object has more mass then there's more inertia right a huge uh, body is very difficult to bring to stop or very difficult to start moving than a much lighter body right so that that, that is the that is the uh, quantity that we look over that the mass how how heavy a particular thing is in terms of solids but in liquids we have this guy called a neat guy called viscosity which tells us whether uh, you know how much resistance do we have to motion uh, whether uh, uh, you know um, uh, whether if it's a very viscous fluid a very large viscosity uh, which means that is very difficult to move that fluid or bring that fluid to rest and things like that and the viscosity its uh, unit is uh, kg uh, per meter second i forgot to mention that in the slide um, and um, and and another uh, you know important um, and and this is the dynamic viscosity and you also have this quantity called as the kinetic viscosity which i represent by nu which is nothing but the mu divided by the density of the fluid and its uh, unit is meter square per second all right so either uh, you know people use it interchangeably by you non know, dimensionalizing or just by dividing it with the density or multiplying with the density so uh, just something I'm, I'm sure you guys would be familiar with but just to uh, refresh the memory and another thing which I want you guys to uh, know is that um, how we characterize viscosity and how what we really uh, and viscosity is a very tricky guy uh, you know it works in the, so mass let's say like inertia for a human being or a, a solid object it's very straightforward mass is just mass how heavy we are but viscosity is a very tricky guy because it acts very differently so we have different these kinds of different objects called as uh, newtonian fluid different fluids what we call as you know newtonian fluids as you see um, uh, on the screen uh, so here is a graph which i'm showing of shear stress versus shear rate so shear stress is nothing but um, just like any shear stress you guys know about uh, you know from solid mechanics you would be knowing about a shear stress or normal stresses so just a shear stress and then here is the shear rate shear rate is given by uh, the velocity let me take the um, partial derivative with respect to some transverse uh, let's say i'm taking my direct velocity if there is a flow which is moving in the x axis with some velocity u i'm going to take how this and let's let my y coordinate be uh, in this way and my x coordinate be in this way and my uh, shear rate over here is nothing but the rate of change of this velocity u with respect to my coordinate y or my derivative with respect to uh, why all right uh, so that is what this shear rate basically tells you and now um, and based upon how this and for different fluids this graph is different the how shear uh, stress uh, depends upon um, uh, you know your um, uh, your uh, your uh, shear shear stress depends upon your shear rate so let me uh, quickly uh, show you uh, let me erase all this and then let me guys talk to you about that um, um uh, yeah so your shear stress and uh, your shear rate will have some form of a relationship and what we call and and based upon the relationship or what we call as the constitutive uh, re constitutive um, relation uh, we characterize different materials or different kinds of fluids so let's say we have one class of material called as a newtonian fluid and Newtonian fluids are nothing but their relationship between shear stress and shear rate is given by this straight line, which starts from zero. Uh, so um, it has a constant slope, which is nothing but the viscosity, the Newtonian, which we call it as a Newtonian viscosity uh, times dou u by dou y. So here, what it means is that, uh, you know, as I increase the shear rate, uh, my shear stress will increase linearly with it and based upon a constant coefficient, um, which is called the viscosity. Uh, so viscosity is a constant over here for a Newtonian fluid and viscosity is, is again uh, for a Newtonian fluid. Uh, do not con confuse it with uh, being constant uh, with respect to temperature and pressure. Viscosity will definitely vary with temperature and pressure for fluids, but with respect to shear rate, shear rate is nothing but how much you are disturbing the flow. Let's say you have a flow moving and then you insert your finger on the flow. That is nothing but you're shearing the flow. You are 
you're just trying to make some commotion within the flow or you're exerting some force on the flow which is really um, shearing the flow or cutting the fluid so that is nothing but the shear rate that you're applying so with respect to shear rate uh, irrespective so my viscosity for a newtonian fluid is not a function of shear rate so my mu newtonian is not a function of uh, do u by uh, do y it's a constant it's a pretty much a constant but it could be a, a function of it could definitely be a function of uh, pressure and temperature all right and my as my shear rate increases linearly my shear stress will also increase linearly for a newtonian fluid and then we have something known as Bing bingham uh, plastics so what bingham plastics are nothing but it's very similar to your newtonian fluids uh, but the shear stress depends initially on some intercept y naught or tau naught tau naught plus mu times uh, dou u by dou y so uh, you have some uh, so even if you are not applying any shear uh, shear rate that imagine let's say you let a bingham plastic flow even if you are not putting a finger in that flow field or trying to disturb the flow field still there is some inherent shear stress in that kind of uh, fluid so that is which is given by the stow knot and then um, as you strain or you know you you add more uh, shearing strain uh, to the fluid this gave the shear stress will keep increasing that's why you see a, a linear plot which is shifted in the y axis all right and next is our um, shear thinning and shear thickening fluids so shear thinning and shear thickening fluids are not that uh, difficult to understand but here in shear thinning and shear thickening fluids your viscosity is a function of your shear rate all right and usually we represent the shear stress shear strain uh, relationship for bingham uh, shear thinning and shear thickening fluids as or we typically call as non-newtonian fluids as um uh, let me let me write it in this way um uh, your uh, do u by do y um, whole power n minus uh, one uh, times some constant uh, k what we call as the flow consistency index so k which is called as the flow consistency index times do u by do y i'm sorry uh, so this is uh, just n not uh, n minus one let me make that correction all right so it's nothing but tau will be a function tau will be given by or your shear stress will be given by some quantity which is called the flow consistency index times the shear rate um, power uh, uh, quantity which we call as a power law constant or um, uh, you know power law exponent for that matter so here if you um, look at your your uh, viscosity is given by an expression like this k times your flow consistency index times do u by do y whole power n minus one and that is very is very easy to deduce uh, right let's say um you know if you if you um uh, you know just just uh, just some rearrangement you know not not uh, very very simple math so your viscosity for a shear thinning or a shear thickening fluid will be given by this expression that is k times your flow consistency index times your shear rate power n minus one n is as i call you the flow consistency index and k is nothing but uh, your i'm sorry your n is the power law index and k is nothing but the flow consistency index and uh, um and 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 for a shear thinning fluid your n is typically less than one um n is less than one and for a shear thickening fluid your n is greater than one so which means that the for shear thinning fluid the more i add disturbance to my flow or the fluid it becomes more and more thinner it, its viscosity reduces it's it, it the 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 uh the particular fluid just becomes more and more thin if you um, look at it let's say initially your uh, uh, fluid might be as thick as honey but then i give more uh, you know force to it i shear it more um it's going to reduce its thick and, and maybe it will look pretty much similar to water maybe that's what they call a shear thinning fluid and for the shear thickening fluids initially you know uh, you guys would have seen maybe some videos of uh, starch uh, people using starch and mixing it with water and then running on top of it then saying that okay we found how to run on top of water so that is exactly a shear thickening kind of fluid that is 
the more uh, force you give to the fluid, the fluid thickens. That let's say initially, let's say your fluid has a mm, as a um, um, as a profile which is similar to water, which is very thin. But then you give more force to it, it becomes thick and and maybe looks like honey with larger larger amount of force and even more. And 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 these fluids have enough power to act as solids under very heavy loads or very large sh uh, shear rates. Uh, so that is where you see uh, people mix starch with water, and then and then the the more force they apply. Let's say um, you are put you're dipping your hand very slowly in such fluid, uh, it, your hand will very smoothly flow through. But let's say you're trying to punch that fluid, your it'll block your hand because it just gets more thick with the more with more more the force you are applying on it. So that is just a different um, type of uh, fluids that we have um, in terms of viscosity. All right. Any questions, anybody? Any questions? Uh, sir, which fluid uh, is it? Uh, shear thickening or uh, thinning uh, uh, is uh, mm -hmm. to act as uh, solid? No, shear thickening. So from the name itself, we can um, understand right? it thickens. Okay, sir. Thank you. All right. Let me move ahead. If there are no other questions. Um, yeah. So yeah, please feel free to ask question at any point of time. You know, it's it's uh, it's something which I really appreciate. So here I have a, you know, a quick uh, question, um, uh, you know, just for you guys uh, to understand what exactly is. So here, find the viscosity of oil from the figure shown below. So here they're asking, they've given us a scenario where obviously they've put oil on an inclined surface, and then you have a, and then you have a, 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 a mass of 5 kg moving on top of it. And they're asking us to find the viscosity. And this is a very straightforward problem. Um, we know that, um, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, what they say is that the mass is moving at a constant velocity of 7 meters per second, and the mass is at a height of, let's say, 2 mm from the surface, and it has got an area at the bottom around. So let's say if I look at the 5 kg mass over here, um, if I take it as a cube, at the bottom or the surface of the cube has an area of around 2 meters square. So that is what they are telling us. And it is oil, and they have to, and it is inclined at an angle of 30 degrees uh, with respect to your uh, horizontal. So one thing which you uh, we can readily understand is that this mass is moving at a constant velocity. But mm, mm, as you know, that any body under the influence of gravity will accelerate, right? Then how can it go at a constant velocity? Which means that the force with which this body is going down is being balanced by some force. Uh, such that uh, it is maintaining a constant velocity, uh, right? Now, just because the forces are balanced doesn't mean that the body will come to rest, right? It just means that the body will not have any acceleration. It will go with a constant velocity is what that means. So what is the force that with which this body is actually moving down um, along the inclined surface? So what is the force? So we know that gravity is acting uh, you know, vertically downwards given by mass times uh, g. And what is the force with which, um, so what is the component of uh, uh, gravitational force that is acting along the slanting surface? Anybody? What is the component of the gravitational force acting along this uh, slanting surface? Anybody? MG sine 30 degrees. All right, yeah. MG sine theta. All right. And now we know that this body is moving at a constant velocity. So it needs, so this force needs to be balanced by something, right? Now, what in, what do you guys think is balancing this force? Maybe, you know, from, uh, you know, whatever understanding that you guys have from, uh, you know, uh, I guess what I've learned, what do you guys think is balancing this force such that this body is moving at a constant velocity? Any yes? Normal resistance. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, could you guys repeat? Yeah, go ahead. So force due to viscosity. Exactly, exactly. So the force due to viscosity, which is nothing but your shear stress, right? 
and oil is a newtonian fluid so for newtonian fluid your shear stress is given by mu times your shear rate right that is your uh, change in velocity by the change in the uh, vertical uh, distance so here the here the viscosity is unknown to us all right the viscosity is unknown to us mu is an unknown but do we know the shear rate over here do we know the shear rate what do you guys think do we know the shear rate in this case anybody 7 by 2 mm 7 meter per second divided by 2 mm exactly so how did we come up with 7 by 2 so let's say uh, you so so this is nothing but some velocity uh, some uh, if i were to write it in uh, you know uh, non differential sense it's some change in velocity divided by the change in the vertical uh, location uh, right um, so change in velocity so we know that um, at this particular point, which is nothing but the oil which is in contact with the inclined surface, the velocity of the oil is zero, right? Because uh, because uh, we know that a fluid at very close to the surface of the body will have zero velocity. But the fluid at this location, which is two mm above it, has a velocity of seven meters per second, right? So the velocity here is changing from zero to seven. So delta u is nothing but zero minus seven meters per second. And what is delta y? Assuming that we start our uh, y-axis from here uh, in this way. So this is so the point where your uh, this this slanting surface is. I'll call it y equal to zero, while this location is nothing but y equal to two, right? Two mm. So my y delta y is nothing but zero to 2 mm, which I'm converting into meters, so I'm multiplying it by uh, 10 power minus 3. All right. So that is my uh, delta u by uh, delta y. All right. And now, so this, so I, I, so I found out, I, I found out what is my shear rate. Uh, so let me write it as 7 divided by uh, 2 into 10 power minus 3. I'll make sure all the units are always consistently taken care of. And next thing is that this is a force, while this is a stress, right? Now we know that uh, this stress is acting over an area which is two meters square, per two, two meters square, which they've already given in the question. It is nothing but the area of the bottom surface of this mass. So to convert this to a force, that is force due to the shear stress, uh, you just have to multiply this with the uh, force will be given by this shear stress times the area that is two. So we know that now we found out what is the force exerted by this shear stress right in this way and that is balancing your uh, weight of the body so let me write the complete expression mu times mm, 7 divided by 2 10 power minus 3 uh, times 2 which is nothing but the area and mass in this question we know it is around 5 kg per um, um, 5 kg right and g is nothing but 9.81 and sine theta is sine of 30 degrees all right so now the only unknown in this problem is nothing but mu mu into 7 and i'll cancel this 2 and 2 and i'll take this uh, 10 power minus 3 on the numerator so that becomes 7000 so i have a straightforward expression to calculate my mu so yeah so everything is known in this expression except mu so just have to rearrange and find the what what, what is the value of mu all right so yeah um, you guys you know, feel feel to calculate what is the value uh, i'm not going to spend too much time on that um and this is how you solve this problem any questions anybody any questions on uh, how we solve this problem very straightforward very simple any questions All right. So this this value is around let's say three point five uh, into ten power minus three. Uh, and uh, so, what is the unit uh, over here? Is it meter square per second or kg per meter second? Anybody? Uh, I'm sorry. I again I didn't hear that clearly. 
ஆரம்பிக்கிறோம்ரிசிபிலிட்டி and that is what we call as compressing let's say by applying pressure or you have the option to pull them apart pull these molecules apart and because and because of which you know the density and things like that will change so that's what i've mentioned here as well with change in pressure and temperature the fluid molecules can neither move move farther or closer and hence either decrease or increase the density so let's say i apply pressure to a fluid i'm making the molecules come closer and i'm increasing the density um right let's say you go back to your density expression now you have mass divided by volume so i take a given mass 1 kg of fluid and then i compress it so now i have the same 1 kg of fluid in a smaller volume right uh, so that will increase my density and vice versa um, uh, correspondingly when i expand the fluid so your compressibility beta is given by um, nothing but delta v divided by v uh, into v into delta p so delta v by v is nothing what we call as your volumetric strain um, um so you guys also would have uh, seen this in your solid mechanics as well your change in the volume divided by the actual volume is your volumetric strain divided by the pressure you the small change in pressure that you gave in to make this um, volume change so let's say uh you given maybe um a 1000 pascal of pressure and my volume compressed um uh, you know the the uh because of which my volume reduced uh, let's say from 1 meter cube to let's say 0.9 meter cube so that's why we have a negative sign because delta v that is the change in volume is a negative quantity so that 0.1 meter cube change divided by the actual volume is 1 times uh, you know the 1000 pascal or 100 pascal that you applied that is called the compressibility um of a fluid and you can also write it uh, you know going back to the expression uh, that mass is equal mass by uh, volume is equal to rho and then i um, um uh, you know uh, do uh, i try to express uh, this derivative with respect to density i can write my compressibility as 1 by rho into d rho by dp so here it was nothing but um uh, you know dv so you can you can either write it as delta v and delta p or dv by dp uh, it just wouldn't make much of a difference but yeah there is some difference mathematically but let's for the time being let's ignore that uh, so you can either write it as do dv by um, v times dp uh, negative of it or you can express it in terms of density as well uh, that is 1 by rho times d rho by uh, dp and here it is positive because when you increase pressure the change in density is a positive guy so Uh, we just want to express the compressibility as a positive number all right and then you also have this bulk modulus uh, right uh, you just similar to what we have in solids um the bulk modulus is nothing but um, uh, the change in pressure uh, divided uh, dp by d rho by uh, rho so it's just you can think of it like uh, you you know a rearrangement of 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 the terms here so k is nothing but 1 by beta so if i take the inverse of this i go to my uh, bulk modulus so compressibility and bulk modulus we say um, inverse of each other for that matter all right uh, so that is um, you know the, that is about the compressibility and then the other important or more important than compressibility or very not i wouldn't say more important but very related co- co- concept is the speed of sound it's the speed with which uh, any disturbance travels so uh, do not consider that uh, you know um, when i call it speed of sound don't consider that uh, you know some sound moves through let's say when i'm talking in a room sound is moving from one end to the other at this particular velocity it's just not sound any disturbance now let's say um, i uh, you, you have you you go to a pond or a lake and then you um, dip your hand inside uh, in a very stationary fluid Uh, it creates some disturbance right 
Now that disturbance too will travel at the same speed. So uh, it's just basically nothing but uh, the speed with which mm, the wave um, is traveling. Uh, so as you know, that sound is a wave which travels by compression and rarefaction, unlike light, which is an electromagnetic wave. So you, similarly, all our disturbance would travel in similar way. Let any disturbance you give at any point in the flu fluid, it travels in the form of a compression rarefaction wave, and it moves at a you know, velocity which is given by A, uh, which is uh, as represented in the screen, A is equal to root of dP by uh, d rho, uh, that basically tells you how much amount of uh, uh, compression is happening to your uh, flow. And then if you have uh, an isentropic, let's say, assuming that your motion of disturbance through your flow field is an isentropic process, um, right? Uh, where you have this in a re reversible process with no heat loss, you can write the dp by d rho or uh, uh, you know this in this form. That is a gamma times p by rho. This is from the expression, nothing but for um, isentropic relation, you have uh, p by uh, rho power uh, gamma is equal to a constant, uh, right? Um, so using this relation, I just need to differentiate with this expression with respect to rho. And then I um, I can whatever comes out I can substitute over here and I get a root of gamma p by rho and for a um, ideal gas p by rho is nothing but R T so finally you end up with an expression uh, so this is the this is the most accurate expression um, uh, d p by d rho and then when you make an assumption of the um, speed of or the motion of disturbance being an isentropic process uh, you end up with this and then on top of that you put in uh, the condition of the gas being or the fluid being an ideal gas or um, things like that um, a perfect gas for that matter your your um, um, uh, expression will boil down to gamma r t okay and then um, this speed of sound is used uh, to calculate what we call as a Mach number, which is nothing but the flow of speed with which your body is moving. Let's say your airplane is moving divided by the speed of sound or the speed of disturbance in that. Let's say your air flight is moving you know, in, some, in the atmosphere. So you calculate the speed with which the flight is moving divided by the speed with which your sound, let's say, would move at the same altitude. And, um, and then we have different flow regimes. Uh, let's say if your Mach number is less than one, it's called subsonic. If your Mach number equal to one, it's called sonic. And then Mach number greater than one is supersonic. And um, and and the, the the main thing is that these three uh, flow fields, right? If your Mach number is less than one, greater than when we do this classification, because your flow features are very different. Um, there are certain things which will happen in a subsonic flow that won't happen in supersonic flow, and vice versa. So that is the main reason why we classify them separately. And also. We also keep in mind that if your Mach number of the flow is less than 0.3, we typically call us call it as an incompressible flow, meaning that your density is not a function of a pressure, um, uh, or you know your density basically you know will remain a constant. You wouldn't have to worry about density changing um, in, you know, in the flow field. But let's say if your Mach number is greater than 0.3, you can uh, say that uh, because of the motion in itself, uh, you do not have to really have to uh, pressure it or anything like that. Just because of the motion of the fluid, you can expect uh, the density to change at different locations in on the flow field. Um, let's say you have air moving from one end of the room to the other end. If it's a, if the flow of air is occurring at a Mach number 0.3, you can typically expect the Mach number, uh, the, the, the density of air at different locations to be different. Um, while if the Mach number is less than 0.3, it'll more or less be, uh, you know, very same at every location. So that is you know, another important concept called the speed of sound. Any question, anybody? Any questions on the compressibility? Any questions on the speed of sound? Sir, uh, unit of compressibility is meter cube per kg, right? um the the unit of compressibility uh, so you the compressibility will have the units uh, so if you if you look at this expression you are dividing volume by volume right and then you have a pressure term in the bottom so it's, it's the inverse of pressure uh, that will be the unit okay sir all right so let me move ahead so here is a quick uh, simple question yeah i'm sorry uh, the the voice was not clear could you repeat so 
I'm sorry, your voice is voice is breaking. Actually, I'm not able to make out. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So so please just take just just check if your connection is all right, and then um, please please feel free to ask the question. So meanwhile, I'll just go ahead with this problem while you uh, take a look at your connection. Mm. So it's a very simple problem. The increase in pressure required to decrease the unit volume of mercury. Uh, so they they they're telling you that um, uh, you know you have mercury at some given some volume uh, v for that matter. Now what they're asking us is that how much change in pressure should I have that is dp to create a unit change, you know decrease in the volume of mercury that is uh, my uh, my my um unit unit uh, to decrease unit volume of mercury by 0.1%. So unit volume of mercury meaning that it's this is unity, let's say one meter cube for that matter. So I want to change the volume of mercury by 0.1%. So my delta V will be nothing but um 0 0.1 divided by 100 into the unit volume uh, which they have given. Now they're asking us how much is the DP required for that? And the bulk modulus is given as uh, 28.5. So 28.5 megapascal, keep that in mind. So 28.5 um, uh, into 10 power uh, 6 pascal is the bulk modulus and you need to find DP. So if we go back, if we go back to the slide, uh, your bulk modulus is related to um, uh, your, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, rho, uh, D rho, so uh, DP by D rho by rho, or rho DP by D rho. So let me write that expression down. Your compressibility, I'm sorry, your bulk modulus is nothing but rho times um, DP by uh, D rho. And and again, uh, just like you know, I I mentioned earlier, your rho and V can be uh, easily interchanged, uh, right? So here they've given you unit volume of mercury. Hello. Yeah. Sir. Why we can't directly go with that form like uh, bulk model is equal to uh, dv mm -hmm. by v dv by v into dp that formula. Uh, which formula are you talking about? That's, this one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can you can definitely go forward with it. There's no problem. So uh, it's just uh, it doesn't really matter. You know which one you're going uh, through by. I can you know tip, use this straight away. So here we have your bulk model is nothing but uh, um, uh, dp. Uh, divided by negative of dp by dv by uh, v, uh, right? I can use this, and I can you know use my mass by volume relation, and then go back to this. Yeah, it's just anything is anything is uh, you know both can be used. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, so okay, so in that case, let's 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 use the other formula, right? Um, or you can take this formula, or if you if you uh, you know, you take one formula, you can easily convert it to other by using uh, density is equal to mass by volume relationship, right? Um, so uh, very straightforward. So let me use the other, the other relation. Okay, let me. Mm, yeah. uh, so let me uh, uh, write it as dp negative of divided by dv by v. All right. Now bulk modulus as as the unit meets around twenty eight point five into uh, ten power uh, six, right? And dp is something which we need to find, and dv by v is is uh, something which they have uh, given me already. That is a unit volume of mercury. So my delta v is in fact reducing. Um, my volume is in fact reducing, uh, right? So my delta v uh, in this case, as I mentioned, was negative of 0.1 by 100 um, into the unity, uh, right? And that divided by, uh, you need a dv by v here, right? So the the the, so the reason why I put a negative over here is, uh, again, the volume is decreasing as you put the pressure in. Um, so again, if I divide this by the volume, uh, they've given you that it's a unit volume of mercury. So again, divided by one. So dv by v is nothing but minus 0.1 divided by 100. So let me write that down here, minus 0.1 divided by 100. Um, and then, you know, I cancel this negative sign and I, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, cancel these two guys um, and then multiply this by 0.1. So I do get my DP uh, around 28.5 into 10 power 
three pascals. All right. So twenty eight point five and ten power three five into ten twenty eight point five into ten power three pascal or twenty eight point five kilopascal. So B is the right option. All right. Any questions? Any questions here, guys? So somebody was asking, trying to ask question earlier, right? Uh, so is their connection all right now? Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Sir, what type of theory questions will be asked? Uh, so from this, uh, you can typically expect uh, not too much. You can just, uh, you know, um, what they can ask is, let's say, uh, based upon for a given compressibility, um, 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 uh, they can ask you, let's say, if I increase the pressure of such a kind of fluid, how what will be the volume change? Or theory questions are, you know, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very, what I feel is very st too straightforward to ask any theory questions out of it because it's just uh, a definition, right? Compressibility is a definition. And another thing, one thing which they can definitely ask you is uh, whether compressibility is a function of pressure and temperature, uh, right? So yes, uh, compressibility in itself uh, will be a function of pressure and temperature. So um, compressibility will have, let's say, if I am trying to compress a fluid at uh, uh, 10 degrees Celsius compared to 100 degrees Celsius, it will be um, different accordingly. Uh, and and uh, you know those uh, are and and how that and and those kind of relationship is something which we'll uh, see you know as we uh, go on later on you know in, in not not in this class maybe in the next class I'll be showing you some charts of how the compressibility will be changing with pressure and temperature. Mm, and those are the and and then basically they can ask you for a liquid how does the compressibility change with pressure and temperature while well, that for a solid um, or uh, I'm sorry. Uh, while that for a uh, gas, how does it change uh, with pressure and temperature? Things like that are uh, are the theory questions that they can be asked, you know, from this uh, topic. And while in speed of sound, a uh, thing to keep in mind is that what are the assumptions involved over here? That is. Um, the the isothermal effect, the ideal gas effect, and then theory questions like uh, how do we define a subsonic, supersonic, sonic flow? What is the compressibility limit? And things like that. Um, uh, yeah, so those are the theory questions that I envision uh, coming from these these uh, topics. And maybe just to add on, um, uh, you know, when I go back to my viscosity, I think I, I, I forgot to put that slide over here. Um, it's that your viscosity is also a function of pressure and temperature, uh, right? And what we typically see is that viscosity of a gas will increase with increase in temperature while viscosity of a fluid or let's say liquid um, not fluid liquid will decrease with increase in temperature so this is just a typical observation and uh, uh, just need to you guys just need to keep this uh, general trend in mind and this is one theory question which i feel can be asked um, in this and then i mentioned uh, you know we'll, we'll talk more about compressibility uh, later on with some charts all right yes. Any other question? All right, so let me move on. Uh, and again, this is another similar problem uh, which was asked in one of these through exams. An increase in pressure of a liquid from 7.5 MPA to 15 MPA results in a 0.2% decrease in its volume. The coefficient of compressibility of this liquid is so again uh, you have to take the dp dp here is nothing but 15 mpa minus 7 mpa so that is nothing but um, 8 mpa i'm sorry 7.5 mpa so that is around 7.5 mpa that is your dp and uh, the the reduction in volume was uh, around two percent so your uh, dv uh, by V here is nothing but uh, negative uh, 0 0.2 divided by 100. And then you can uh, use uh, the relationship for uh, beta, which we discussed in the previous uh, slide. Um, uh, beta is nothing but uh, uh, delta V by V by delta P. So beta is nothing but minus uh, dV by V uh, times dP. Uh, so in this case, it's nothing but point two um, by 100 uh, into your dp which is nothing but 7.5 uh, megapascal um, uh, so make sure that you change the units to pascal uh, 
so that will be your compressibility uh, factor over here or coefficient of compressibility another very straightforward problem all right let me move ahead let me talk a little bit about surface tension um, um so surface tension is again another property of the fluid as i uh, just like the viscosity density um, so what surface tension exactly mean is nothing but let's say you have a container filled with a fluid and uh, and and you would have um, noticed that the the layer on top right the the layer which forms an interface between the fluid part and then the the air the gaseous part look like a film right look like a film which is very strong or it looks like a stretched membrane um you guys would have uh, heard that uh, part a number of times uh, so it, it looks like a stretched membrane the reason why the reason because of which uh, so if you look at the uh, molecule which is present at the surf at the bottom um, let's say and the, in the bulk of the fluid is what we call uh, uh, let's say it's somewhere in the middle you see that the the this molecule will be uh, you know in 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 Mm, uh, attractive or repulsive or whatever the kind of uh, force with other water molecules right so water or other fluid molecules so you'll have a number of fluid molecules here and there and mm, and this fluid molecule will be in some kind of a force equilibrium with the other molecule so it's the net force on this molecule is pretty much zero that you know there are so many molecules present all you know around it in every other three dimensional direction that it in more or less remains in equilibrium while the, if you look at the fluid, the, the molecule at the real top surface, what you see is that it can only see, you know, uh, molecules at the bottom part of it. It does not see any similar molecules, right? It it's, it definitely sees air molecules above it, but it does not does not see um, fluid molecules or let's say water molecules if this is a glass of water. So it's the so here main importantly it's the coercive force that acts. Coercive force is nothing but a force that or the or force that or uh, so not coercive force the um, the adhesive force kind of uh, which which basically acts between very similar molecules um, so uh, you know this guy had number of similar water molecules surrounding it so it was in a force equilibrium while this guy is only seeing uh, similar water molecules uh, you know uh, in, in, in in at the bottom part and the top part it does not see any similar molecules so there is some net imbalance of force uh, from the top right so there so there is a net force uh, imbalance over here now to make this force imbalance go away what the layer on top will do is so if i look from the top i'll see a layer like this with a number of uh, water molecules uh, rounding it so what these molecules on the surface will do is that will try to form some bond or some force in sideways that is you know uh, when well, let's say there is one molecule over here sitting over here it looks to the guys some you know nearby it left and right and they form some kind of a force equilibrium and that basically adds on to the the strength of whatever the film is or it's basically like um, you are forming a bond the all the molecules that are lying on the surface of this uh, container is forming a bond with every other molecule on the surface and it forms a system which is a very strong system and that is the main reason why it forms a very strong film over which is strong enough that some insects can walk over it in fact um, so that is what we call a surface tension and it's it's and mathematically is represented by sigma uh, which is the force divided by some length length uh, so the length scale over which these uh, so there is this linear length scale over which these molecules come together mm, let's say if i'm taking a container it will be the diameter of the container um, or otherwise you know if the situation is different and then whatever the force with which these molecules are coming together with and its um, unit is newton per meter and and this surface tension force is very very critical in in some of uh, let's say formation of the planets in itself uh, that our uh, planets uh, or let's say there are many fluidic systems like let's say uh, uh, jupiter uh, um, i guess 
uh, there are planets like uh, maybe I think Jupiter is just a, a cloud of gases and you know things like that. So there, just for such a planet to form itself, um, uh, you know, the surface tension is a very important property such that these molecules are present on the surface. They form a real tough film, which prevents anything from going out or anything from coming in and acts like a protective layer. And and in our day to day life, uh, we see very uh, important application of surface tension in the formation of a drop or a bubble. Uh, so drop, as you know, um, a liquid drop, it has an interface with gas and then, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, gas and then inside it is completely liquid, right? So this interface uh, forms as a boundary between uh, your water molecules inside the drop and the gas molecules outside. And this um, surface tension is the force that binds this drop together. If there was no surface tension, this drop would just disintegrate and then uh, there won't be any drop in the first place. And we have some quick formula um, uh, given by delta P is equal to four sigma by D. So four uh, sigma is nothing but the surface tension of water um, divided by D diameter of the drop. And delta P is nothing but the difference in the pressure inside and outside the drop. So inside, let's say there is some pressure which is called PI, which is acting inside the drop and outside PO, some pressure is acting, let's say atmospheric pressure. Now for the drop to remain as such without disintegrating, these guys should be um, in some form of uh, equilibrium, right? So let's say if, if PI is greater than PO or PO is greater than PI, if PI is greater than PO, your drop will just burst out. Uh, well, if PO is greater, your your um, you, your your drop will basically implode, right? Now that is where your surface tension comes in, and then maintains an equilibrium between these two uh, counteracting forces. So this difference between um, the the difference between the internal external pressure and the internal pressure. Um, for the drop is given by you know given by this four sigma by d and for a bubble and the way bubble is different from a drop is a drop is completely uh, you know filled inside with whatever the fluid let's say it's a water droplet it will be full water inside well bubble is pretty much hollow inside so you'll have an interface which is made up some liquid uh, while inside will be just gas um, hollow and then outside again uh, you know you'll have let's say gas or something like that so there uh, you know since it is hollow inside, you'll need more surface tension force to hold this bubble together. That's why bubbles are very easier to disintegrate, right? Um, than drop. Uh, so in such cases, the difference between the internal and external pressure is given by eight sigma by uh, D for a bubble and drop uh, respectively. And this is where in one case, uh, you know, surface tension comes into play. Any questions, anybody? Any questions? All right, so let me move ahead. So here are a couple of questions again from uh, ISRO uh, exam. So if the surface tension of water air interface is 0 0.073 Newton per meter, and again, uh, surface tension depends upon what is the interface, whether it is between water and air or water and maybe oil, because it, it, the, the surface tension force is uh, based upon some molecular action, right? Between molecules of air, molecules of water and things like that. Mm, so it, it changes with respect to what interface it is. So here they've given the surface tension between air and water is, uh, so sigma is around 0 0.073 uh, Newton per meter. The gauge pressure inside the raindrop of one mm diameter. So what they're asking us is the gauge pressure inside of, and we'll talk more about gauge pressure later on. What they're asking us is that there's a raindrop and, uh, you know, as I told you, there's an internal pressure uh, while there is an external pressure PO. In this case, it's a raindrop, right? So the external pressure is nothing but the atmospheric pressure, uh, which is acting on the outside of 101325 um, uh, Pascals uh, is the um, um, external atmospheric pressure acting over here. And as I told you, the DP for a drop is given by four sigma um, by D. Uh, and here sigma is given as uh, 0 0.073. Um, and D is uh, given by one mm uh, diameter. Uh, so one into 10 power minus three and make sure you convert the uh, units. And, and this DP um, is nothing but a PI minus uh, the internal pressure minus the uh, external pressure. 
and uh, and and they asked you what is the gauge pressure so gauge pressure is nothing but any pressure um, um, um subtracted with the atmospheric pressure uh, so once i find my so from this expression um, uh, you know i'm going to find what is my pi and then i subtract my um, uh, atmospheric pressure from that uh, 101325 and luckily in our case my po is also atmospheric pressure so you wouldn't have to do the subtraction again just we just have to find pi minus po or dp directly uh, so um and that is basically going to give my um, gauge pressure uh, which um i believe it's option d all right and similarly uh, very similar to this you have the the soap bubble which has an inside pressure pi of 2.5 newton per meter square uh, while um, um, or 2.5 pascals uh, over the atmospheric pressure and surface tension is uh, and, and and our atmospheric pressure Mm, and uh, so here, keep in mind that which is an inside pressure of 2.5 newton meters over the atmospheric pressure, which means that we have to add this pressure to the atmospheric pressure. So it's over the atmospheric. So in addition to atmospheric pressure, it has a, has got an extra pressure of 2.5 pascal. So the total internal pressure will be nothing but 2.5 pascal plus uh, the atmospheric pressure in itself. Mm, and and the surface tension is given by uh, so and so. And they're asking us what should be the diameter of the soap bubble that will be formed under such a condition. And again, you can, we can use the same uh, relationship what we saw six sigma by D uh, will be nothing but DP. At DP, we know that um, PI is nothing but 101325 plus 2.5 and outside pressure is going to be atmospheric pressure. So my DP is nothing but 2.5 Pascal um, and sigma is already given in the question. So we calculate what is the diameter, um, which uh, you know I'm leaving it to you guys to find out. So this are very simple problems from surface tension topics. All right, any questions over here? Anybody, anybody who's not clear about anything that we did, please feel free to come forward and ask. Uh, so I'm taking that as an yes, and then I'm moving ahead. Um, so next is uh, what we call as the capillarity. Uh, so I'm not going to go too much into detail about capillarity. Just going to talk to you about what it means. Um, and so let's say you ha you have uh, you'd have a container filled with water, and you insert a very thin tube, uh, thin in the sense that its diameter should be really thin into it. So when you insert it, you will see that the you'll see water rising in this capillary tube by some height, or let's say water level going inside that tube, depending upon whether uh, the the fluid is wetting or non-wetting. Uh, so if it's a wetting fluid like water, you will see water level rising inside that um, um, uh, container or whatever the tube you put in, or water level falling if it's a non-wetting um, uh, kind of. Uh, fluid, like let's say, um, um, you know, um, again, you know, non-wetting uh, depends on what 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 the solid material is and what the fluid is, um, and 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 you can basically see some rise in the height of water level or fall in the uh, fall in uh, water level height, and which uh, is given by this expression, um, four sigma cos theta by rho g d where sigma is nothing but the surface tension of the interface uh, of well, let's say fluid and air and uh, fluid or whatever the other fluid is cos theta is nothing but the um, wetting angle or the um, uh, what we call as angle of contact basically and rho is nothing but the density of the fluid d is nothing but the um, diameter of this uh, container uh, so this is a and this has a lot of application in cavitation and things like that which um, uh, you know um, not be that relevant uh, from this exam point of view um, so this is a phenomenon that happens and, and keep in mind that it needs to be a, uh, a very thin tube because your diameter comes in at the bottom uh, right. Uh, so your capillary height depends upon how high the surface tension is, whether it is uh, wetting or non wetting. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're, if you're using a very large diameter, it comes in the denominator and then the height of increase is very small and you wouldn't see this phenomenon. And this phenomenon again is because of the surface tension force, which balances the weight of the fluid over here. Um, essentially, the surface tension is basically pulling this fluid up uh, in this way or pushing the fluid down in this way. Uh, so um, that is what is happening in capillarity. Uh, so it depends upon angle of contact, um, angle of 
uh, contact uh, between the material uh, of whatever the fluid is and whatever the solid material is um, and surface tension and density of the fluid. So this is what um, uh, you know capillarity is again not to go to mention to detail uh, just to give you guys an idea. All right. So now um, let me quickly talk about another concept of uh, uh, what we call as continuum and vacuum. So we know that uh, whatever uh, we uh, let's say on Earth we have air around us and we call it as like a continuum um, air with certain atmospheric pressure, but we call space as a vacuum, right? Because there is not much material or um, or uh, medium in it. So roughly speaking, continuum is a a medium or a space. Let's say if I take a room uh, and if I want to call this a room as a continuum, uh, it should be filled with something. Let's say air or water, but in a good amount. Let's say there should be, there is considerable amount of air and water in it, and there is large large number of molecules of air and water which is present in in this system. I call that as a continuum. While if I go take the same container and then I suck out all the air or water in it and then leave it nothing but empty, and there are very 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 minute uh, one molecule here, one molecule there, just like how you have in space with very there's no air there, right? Um, so, um, so in such case we call it as vacuum, and this is just from a pure crude uh, sense. And to have a more mathematical definition, uh, we introduce this concept called mean free path. So mean free path is nothing but the distance traveled by the molecule between two successive collisions. So what I mean by that is, we know that in fluids the molecules are very free to move. They can move from one point to the other easily, uh, you know, without much uh, interference. Um, so when you when you have a number of uh, um, you know fluid molecules just like in this case so this molecule will hit this molecule first and then it, it might bounce off in a different direction where it will find another molecule because the molecules are very closely where are, are there right there are more number of molecules in the system so anywhere the, your your one molecule go uh, it might find there will be more chances of finding another molecule to bounce off so uh, so after this collision, let's say after collision with this molecule, uh, it rebounded and then went in this direction. Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> it it went off in this direction and then hit this molecule. So the distance uh, that so let's say um, um, you know upon colliding this molecule upon colliding with this molecule that is my collision one. Now, after colliding with this, this molecule took a trajectory like this, and then there is another molecule over here, um, uh, and then it went and collided this molecule. So the distance that this molecule covered after rebounding from this molecule and before it reached this molecule. So let me call, call this molecule A and it's called molecule B. So this guy uh, C, uh, after hitting A, how much distance did it travel before hitting B? That is what they call it as mean free path or uh, L, uh, what they call it. So essentially saying that if, if the system contains a large number of molecules, if there are good enough molecules which are present in the system, uh, this L will be a very small quantity, right? It'll be very really small because there are enough number of molecules which are present in the neighborhood uh, that your molecule will travel very minimal distance before colliding with another molecule, right? Uh, so uh, that is uh, what the concept of mean free path is. While if if it's a vacuum case, uh, this guy will collide with this guy, and then it will move in a different direction, and it'll take a very long. It'll travel have to, it'll have to travel a very long distance before it finds another molecule to collide right in a vacuum kind of situation. So uh, that's why in uh, the mean free path will be larger, very large um, in a vacuum case. So the, the we typically define a number called as a Knudsen number, which is nothing but the mean free path divided by some length of the mm, medium. So let's say I told I'm taking a container or a room and filling it with air or water. So the length of this room or width of this room, I'm taking it as the uh, characteristic length scale over here and upon which I'm uh, putting my mean free path. And it typically we uh, as a rule of thumb, our Knudsen number should be really small, much less than one to call the flow a continuous flow. Or a medium to be continuum, while the nuts and number, if it, if it is really large, um, you know, greater than or close to one at least, then we call it as a, um, um, uh, 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 
a vacuum and we call such for flow as flows so any um, flow in the flow of a continuous medium uh, we call it as a continuum flow while uh, any flow of a medium which is in vacuum or where there is a very less number of molecules involved we call it as a um, rarefied flow uh, basically uh, which typically we see um, um, when when there is reentry uh, uh, when 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 um, you are whenever you are uh, uh, spaceship is moving in space uh, you, you know it, it basically encounters a rarefied it basically undergoes a rarefied mechanics or rarefied motion uh, with a vacuum present with very less number of molecules present around it uh, so that is the difference between continuum and vacuum uh, in a, in a in a standalone sense as well as a mathematical sense in terms of nuts and number all right any questions anybody Any questions? Anything that you guys aren't clear with, please feel free to come up. All right. Moving ahead, let me talk a bit about pressure. And you guys uh, from your solid mechanics would already know that a pressure is nothing but some force per unit area, right? Uh, the force which is acting normal to the surface so you have a surface you have the force which is acting normal to the surface um, and then you divide that force by the area upon which it is acting you get pressure right force by area now this force could be um, an external force let's say you are trying to uh, you're, you're hitting the wall right uh, so you're the force with which you exerted uh, the force which you exerted on the wall divided by the area with over which you exerted it um, you can find the pressure that you exerted on the wall and um, you know whatever and you guys know that the the dimension is nothing but newton per meter square or units is newton per meter square or pascal uh, and things like that and um, um, and while it's very um, uh, easy uh, to it's very easy to uh, visualize pressure in terms of the solid uh, um, or in terms of our macro things, right? Um, let's say you are punching a guy, you are exerting some pressure on him, things like that. But from a fluid sense, from a fluid dynamics perspective, what this pressure means? Okay, let's let me talk about the atmospheric pressure in, in the first place. Uh, when you tell, when you when you say that the atmospheric pressure is so and so, what does that really mean? So just give me a, a second, guys. Let me drink some water and come. Um, Um, so is my voice all right now? Yeah, great. Um, so, uh, so again, um, as I mentioned, uh, the air molecules uh, will will be in continuous motion, right? And then they come uh, hit your body, and and then they keep bombarding your body um, every now and then. And the force with which uh, divided by the area that they bombard your body is what you call as pressure. And, and 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 that is exactly what a pressure of a fluid means. Let's say you have any you take any surface, and then you let the fluid molecules bombard that surface. That is exactly what you call as a pressure of the fluid over there. Or 
it could be the pressure with which one molecule is hitting the other. That is, you measure the pressure at any point uh, in a flow field, or in you know, in, let's say you measure the pressure in your room. The pressure that you see over there is nothing but the pressure with which the molecules are bombarding against each other, or bombarding against your wall, or bombarding against the uh, the, the the meter that you used over to, to calculate the pressure. Things like that. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that is what. What exactly means uh, by pressure? That is exactly what pressure means from fluid dynamics perspective. And we also have this concept of absolute pressure and gauge pressure. So absolute pressure is nothing but your atmo any pressure times the gauge. So let's say mm, uh, uh, you know I have a water container, and the water container is at let's say atmospheric pressure PATM. Right. Now what I'm going to do is that. I'm going to add, uh, you know, maybe 10 Pascal pressure. I'm going to just put a pressure of 10 Pascal uh, on this. Now, in this case, the total pressure or the absolute pressure of the system is nothing but your atmospheric pressure plus the uh, 10 Pascal which I put, and this 10 Pascal or the, the 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 DP which I put or the extra pressure that I put in is called as the gauge pressure, or the extra pressure what I uh, put in, um, we typically call it as a gauge pressure and, and that absolute pressure or the total pressure of the system becomes, um, not, may not be right to call it the total pressure, but the absolute pressure of the system is nothing but the atmospheric pressure, which is already there, uh, plus the extra uh, 10 Pascal that I put in. And absolute pressure, and if I'm removing pressure also, uh, I can calculate in you know, a similar way that your absolute pressure will be nothing but um, the atmospheric pressure minus uh, what we call as the vacuum pressure, or if I'm taking out from a system, I'm taking out, let's say, 10 Pascal uh, out, or um, it may not be right to say I'm taking out pressure, uh, but assume that there is a reduction in pressure. That you know, from an initial system which was at one uh, one atmosphere, I somehow was able to reduce the pressure by uh, 10 Pascal. So that reduction in pressure is what you call as the vacuum pressure, and the absolute pressure becomes nothing but atmospheric pressure minus uh, the vacuum pressure. Uh, so if you're adding pressure. You have to get the absolute pressure. You add it to the atmospheric pressure. You add whatever you are putting in uh, to the atmospheric pressure. While if there's some reduction in pressure, you subtract it from your atmospheric pressure, and and hereby end up with your absolute pressure. Uh, so this is uh, you know just some jargons uh, that we have typically from a pressure point of view. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Let me jump ahead. And let me talk about a very, very important law from this pressure point of view. So Pascal's law uh, is, is really important and it's applied almost everywhere, uh, you know, in a number of places as I know. So Pascal law, what it states is that uh, the in so let's say let's say you take um, uh, you know a container as a, as I've shown in this figure right a water container and these black dots are nothing but the water molecules imagine mm -hmm. mm, what Pascal's law says is that the intensity of pressure at any point in a fluid at rest is same in all direction so let's say I take one uh, water molecule or let's say I go to a single point um, you know in my in my flow field. Uh, or as I, I just take a single point um, now you know, given by this black dot, you can you can consider it as a single point, a particular point in my um, flow domain. What Pascal's law states is that the, the and, and pressure will be acting uh, at this point from different directions, uh, right? Uh, because there are a number of fluid molecules which are going to bombard this uh, area or bombard this point. So uh, pressure is going to act from different directions. and uh, and what it, it it basically means is that, uh, and so so keep in mind here that we know we have already learned that pressure can only act normal to a body, uh, but here you you should you should consider that this is the point I'm talking about. It's it's not really a surface which I'm talking about. So a point is pretty much a zero dimensional mathematical entity. Uh, so here what I'm saying is that. When when I have, when I look at this particular point and I look at different uh, the pressure forces uh, acting from every other direction, what Pascal's law says is that the pressure at this particular point, irrespective of whatever the direction that this force is coming from, will be the same in magnitude. That if it's 10 Pascal over here, it will be 10 Pascal coming from here. It will be 10 Pascal coming from here. It will be 10 Pascal coming from here. And the reason 
because of which this is happening. One thing, the fluid is not moving. Another thing, we are looking at a point. We are not looking at any surface. We are not looking at a two-dimensional or a one-dimensional surface. We are looking at a single point in space. So in that point in space, you can be assured that irrespective of whatever the direction I'm looking at for the pressure force, let's say some um, uh, molecules are bombarding it from this direction, some molecules are bombarding it from this direction, doesn't really matter. Whatever the force they're going to exert on this um, uh, on this uh, point and converting that to the pressure is going to be the same. So that is what uh, you know Pascal's law states. And one interesting application of Pascal law is the hydraulic press. Um, hydraulic press is nothing but, especially you can see, uh, you know, when you want to lift very heavy objects. Uh, so what they have is a setup as, as shown here, uh, and most of you will be familiar with that. So they have um, a container uh, of filled with some fluid, um, and they, you'll you'll see one one area where there's a larger, uh, uh, you know, you'll see one one portion uh, with a larger area, while other portion with a much smaller area. And you are free to exert force either from here or here. And if I let's say, and and you guys uh, can imagine, right? If I push from here, my uh, this location will move up. While if I push from here, my this location will move up. Just like uh, you know, um, you you push anything. Mm, so the interesting application of this hydraulic press is that. <laughs> um, you know, let's say you want to, um, um, as 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 I mentioned. Uh, irrespective of uh, uh, if if I if I apply some pressure over here, the same pressure will get transmitted here as well. So if I apply pressure P over here, this point will also receive the same pressure P. And so and this location one, your pressure uh, P um, pressure P is given by nothing but the force which is acting over here. Let's say F1 divided by area one. That is the area at this location. While in this location, the same pressure will be transmitted to a different force because um, let me call it as F2 divided by area 2 because uh, these two locations are typically different in area. There will be higher area over here and a lower area over here, which is based upon uh, you know how this thing works, uh, right? Uh, so uh, it's, it's, you apply the same pressure, but because of the difference, you are apply you are applying the same force. Uh, you are applying some um, uh, some force F over an area A1 uh, over here, and that corresponds to some pressure P, while the same pressure is being experienced over here, but over a much smaller area. So which will means that the force which is experienced at this uh, location might, you know, should be uh, more or less, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, larger for that. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, larger, uh, smaller for that matter. Mm -hmm. So if if uh, you know one interesting application that you you know uh, you can think of is that let's say I want to lift a car or a very heavy object of weight W over here, um, as you can see, and I need to uh, you know lift it up, um, and so the force that I need to the pressure that and that I need to apply uh, here is nothing but W divided by mm, the area the large area, and this is the pressure uh, which is seen here as well. So the so uh, so that pressure will be transmitted to some force F divided by the area of this location A. So if I rearrange these terms, what it essentially means is that I can write the force at this location is nothing but the weight of the body that I want to lift divided by the area over there times the area at this location. Let me call it as A2 and this as A1. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a, a thousand kg car which you want to lift over um, an area of maybe 100 um, uh, 10 meters square just i'm just just making up these numbers while this smaller area section might be let's say 0.1 meters per second for that matter so the amount of force that you would need to exert over here to lift a car of 1000 kg is nothing but let's say uh, you know if you look at it you just have to exert maybe 10 kg force here or 10 kg into 9.8 uh, that is the force that you need to exert in this smaller area location to lift a much larger weight in the other location, um, just because uh, uh, you know one is of a larger area while the other, and and Pascal's law says that the pressure is going to be the same uh, irrespective of the location. So that is an interesting application where you want to lift a very heavy object, but by exerting a very small force. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Is there anything in the chat? Uh, did I miss? I saw something being something uh, something coming on in the chat um, so any questions
any questions guys any questions on whatever i was explaining over here any any confusions all right uh, so let me so okay so is everybody clear with the concept is everybody clear great so let me move ahead so here again you know another question simple question a hydraulic press uh, which we saw in the previous slide has a ram of 15 centimeter diameter and a plunger of 1.5 centimeter so this larger area section is what we call as a ram while the smaller area is what we call as the plunger. Uh, so the ram here is 15 centimeter in diameter, while the plunger is around 1.5 centimeters. It is required to lift a mass of 1,000 kgs. The force required on the plunger. So the ram should be lifting a force of 1,000 a mass of 1,000 kg. So how much force I need to apply over here? So we let's calculate first the pressure that is required to lift a 1,000 kg object. So the pressure that is required to uh, lift a 1,000 kg object is nothing but 1,000 into 9.81 divided by pi into uh, 15 centimeters uh, uh, so pi by 4 into uh, i convert the diameter to meters uh, and so this is the pressure and that is the same pressure which will be ex experienced by the plunger right so plunger will experience the same pressure um, while the force requ force that we need to exert on the plunger is given let's say it's given by f and the area of the plunger is, I think, but pi by 4 um, into 1.5 into 10 power minus 2 uh, whole square. Um, and is again, force, 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 needed, force needed to be applied to the plunger divided by the area of the plunger is equal to the pressure which, which, needs, which needs to be exerted to lift up this guy, right? So let me uh, write that down as well. Um, thousand into uh, nine point eight one uh, divided by pi by four into uh, fifteen into uh, ten power minus two whole square. All right, so then you can you know, it's a very simple calculation pi by four pi by four you can cancel out ten power minus two you can cancel out one point five divided by fifteen becomes ten and then square of that becomes hundred and then you cancel this guy out. And your force will be nothing but 10 into 9.81, um, or you know, roughly you can take 9.81 as 10 itself. Uh, so that will be 100 newtons. Option A. So to lift a mass of 1000 kg, you just need to exert a force of 100 newtons, uh, you know, on the plunger. All right. Is that clear? Is that clear to everybody? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that well. Somebody has a question. Yes, sir. All right, all right. Okay, so moving ahead um, is another concept is nothing but uh, extension of the Pascal's law is what we call as the hydrostatic pressure variation. So hydrostatic pressure variation is nothing but inside the body of a, so let's say I have a container um, um, filled with some fluid um, here. So I know that at the surface, uh, you know, at the surface, the pressure will be nothing but atmospheric pressure, right? And the reason being that this surface is being continuously bombarded by air molecules, which are at the surface. Uh, so that will exert nothing but the atmospheric pressure. And now the interesting question is that if this stay fluid is stationary along the height of the container as I go down from surface where H is equal to zero to some height, let's say, um, uh, you know, H, what is the, will, will the pressure, if, if it is atmospheric pressure over here, will that, will it be the same atmospheric pressure or will it increase? So the idea here is that um, as you go down the body of the fluid, your pressure will keep increasing. Uh, by a factor of rho g h. So let's say if I go by a height of h, capital H, my pressure, the absolute pressure will be nothing but the atmospheric pressure plus rho g capital H, where rho is nothing but the density of the fluid, g is nothing but the uh, dynamic acceleration due to gravity, h is nothing but the mm, height, the, the vertical distance that I've covered. So the 
absolute pressure at a height h at the bottom will be nothing but atmospheric pressure because that was the pressure we started with. Or if it, if it is not atmospheric pressure, let's say we start with some random pressure P1. So this again will be nothing but P1 plus rho g h. So it so so your total pressure or the absolute pressure at the bottom of the container or at a height h is nothing but the pressure with which you started on the surface plus the uh, rho times g times h. And this rho times the reason why this pressure is increasing is because as you go below, so if I, if I look at a height h, this layer is not only supporting the atmospheric pressure, but it is also supporting a huge, uh, you know, water mass above it or the fluid mass above it. Uh, so on the surface, you have air molecules bombarding at atmospheric pressure. But as I go down, there is on the surface at height h, there is this water molecules also bombarding um, bombarding the surface and it is supporting a mass of let's say around the rho times g uh, times uh, whatever the volume of the container is that much mass is of fluid is being contained or being supported by this guy so that is where you see pressure increasing as we go down and your pressure graph will basically look something like this that is it will start at atmospheric pressure over here at the surface and then it will keep increasing and uh, and then this will be nothing but p atmosphere plus rho uh, g and capital h all right so let me let me um, write that well so you start at um, atmosphere or any pressure whatever is the surface let me call it as a surface pressure and as i go down you keep increasing linearly because it is uh, you are uh, you are increasing with respect to h right so it's nothing but surface pressure plus rho times g times h or whatever so um so with respect to the height uh, your pressure will increase linearly given by this relationship so that is what they call as the hydrostatic pressure at a point and this is true only when your fluid is at, at rest but if your fluid is moving then you know it's a completely different story all right any questions Any questions here, guys? Okay, so moving ahead, um, another one important um, application of the Pascal's law is what we call as a barometer. A barometer is something which they use to uh, calculate um, what is the atmospheric pressure, and um, and and so what they we use what we typically call as a mercury barometer. Uh, so what it's it's a, it's a setup in which uh, you take a fluid which has very high density and very low vapor pressure and vapor pressure is something which you guys will uh, learn in thermodynamics as well it's the pressure with which um, pressure with which the vapors of a fluid will uh, will uh, will bombard the uh, surface the interface between the vapor phase and the liquid phase so we take a fluid um, like mercury which has very high density and very low vapor pressure uh, in the in a in a container like this so this whatever you see is, is nothing but mercury and then you put an inverted let's say a u a kind of a tube which is inverted on this so when you put the inverted tube you will see that so there will be some amount of mercury which is rising by a height h and the way and 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 and, and whatever on the so so it will rise to a particular height h and there will be some empty space on the top and the empty space on the top will be filled with vapors of mercury uh, because uh, some vapors will move away some molecules will evaporate from the surface and create some vapor pressure over there uh, so that is nothing but uh, vapor pressure mm, um, so some 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 um, uh, vapors of mercury mm, um, sure sir I, i'll end the session when class is over yeah um so um uh, so yeah um uh, so uh, Moro classes at the same time. Okay, sure. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, coming back to there will be some vapors of mercury over here, and then um, um, you will have uh, uh, you will ha you will have some vapor pressure exerted by these vapors as well. So now the idea here is nothing but you know, let's say I take I consider two points A and B um, you know on the surface uh, here right. So A point A is outside being exposed to the atmosphere while point B is inside the tube, um, not exposed to atmosphere. 
so point A, I know that since it is exposed to atmosphere, the pressure at point A is nothing but atmospheric pressure. And from Pascal's law, we know that um, uh, you know pressure uh, experienced by every other point. Um, you know, if you if you disregard the height, so A and B are all, almost at the same height level as well, right? So point uh, A and point B should receive the same pressure, right? Because they belong to the same body of fluid. That's the same fluid, all right? Same mercury fluid. So point A and point B will have the same pressure. So point A has atmospheric pressure, while point B the pressure will be nothing but the vapor pressure um, um, over here. And since it is not exposed to atmospheric pressure, so it's, it's not really atmospheric pressure. So there's vapor pressure of the mercury over here, plus the hydrostatic pressure variation like how we saw. That is surface pressure plus rho GH. So rho of the mercury G times height to which mercury has risen in the barometer. So your atmospheric pressure is nothing but rho mercury times g times h plus vapor pressure and since we take uh, uh, and a, a fluid or liquid with very low vapor pressure i can assume this to be zero and my atmospheric pressure is nothing but density of mercury times g times height to which uh, my mercury has risen in this container so that is one way if i know i know density of mercury i know what is from the experiment i know what is the height to which it has risen and i can easily find what is my atmospheric pressure all right, a simple setup, um, you know, in which they do this and, and very important application of Pascal's law. All right, any questions? All right, so maybe um, since uh, we are very close to uh, our time here, uh, let me um, let me talk a bit about, uh, or maybe I'll, I'll do this in the next class. Then um, I have some problems as well. Uh, so yeah. So next class we'll talk a bit about YouTube manometers, and then we'll solve some very simple uh, problems. And we'll also look into some concepts of buoyancy, and we should be able to jump into um, concepts like fluid kinematics. Um, so yeah. Uh, so I am uh, steady mid. Yeah, I forgot to uh, mention that in my slides. Uh, so for fluid mechanics, I would prefer you guys follow um, the book called Okishi, uh, Munson and Okishi Fundamentals of Fluid Mechanics. Um, and for aerodynamics, uh, uh, follow you can follow J.D. Anderson. Um, I think aerodynamics for engineers. Uh, yeah. So that is a book. Uh, uh, so. Okishi, Munson and Okishi, um, and uh, um, uh, J.D. Anderson for uh, aerodynamics. So these are really good books from my experience, um, and that will be more than sufficient. They, they contain you know, really good material, good good explanation uh, to prepare you guys for the exam. All right, any, any, any other questions that you guys want to ask me before we disperse? Anything, anything, um, you know, any concepts or anything, anything you guys want to ask me. All right. Um, so, yeah. So thanks, thanks, guys, uh, for attending and um, about assignments. Mm, so assignments right now, I um, I think you, Dinesh sir will be a better uh, person to talk about it because he's the one who will be assigning which all we have a uh, number of assignments for for gate point of view. Uh, so I I think we we have some we will be making some special assignments for uh, this particular case. Uh, so you the, the, that information is Dinesh sir is a better person person to ask that I do not have uh, much idea about it. Mm, all right, um, and. Uh, Assign that as assignments and yeah, I think and then uh, we're planning to have a mock test as well. So you can ask about that as well to Dinesh sir. And 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 most importantly, if you guys uh, have any 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 thoughts on how I can improve this class based upon the way it is being conducted, or you guys feel that I'm going too fast or too slow, 
or I need to do something, I need to explain things a bit better, or I need to do more problems or talk about something else. Uh, so please, please uh, do bring that up. I will be happy to make those changes because uh, in, in the end, it needs to benefit um, you folks, right? Uh, so yeah, please, please uh, feel free to uh, bring anything up, um, you know, mm, mm, bring any feedbacks that you have from the class. Uh, just so that I can I can improve my teaching um, and you guys will benefit as well. So yeah. And if you have any anything uh, straight right now, please feel free to bring it. Sir, uh, difference between absolute and total pressure. Uh, yeah, so absolute pressure is nothing but a comparison that we're doing with the atmospheric pressure. So, as I mentioned, absolute pressure um, will be calculated. Uh, um, um, let's say uh, if I'm adding pressure to something, uh, absolute pressure will be atmospheric plus that pressure I added or if there's a reduction in pressure. So subtract that while total pressure is a bit different. So total pressure is a combination of your static pressure and your dynamic pressure. Um, and while 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 and and that applies to uh, a body in motion uh, basically um, or um, let's say um, you know body in rest as well uh, but that has very uh, nothing to do with uh, atmospheric pressure over here your atmospheric pressure can be something but for total pressure you you can either you so so the idea being your total pressure can be expressed as a gauge pressure or a absolute uh, pressure. Mm, so let me not uh, talk too much and confuse you. So when we when we go to aerodynamics portion, I'll be talking uh, mathematical in mathematical sense as well as physical sense. What these actually mean, what static pressure means, what dynamic pressure means, and what total pressure means, and you'll get a better idea. Uh, but just for the time being, you just know that. Absolute pressure, we do uh, measure everything in relative uh, to atmospheric pressure, how much more, atmo more than atmospheric pressure, how much less than atmospheric pressure, things like that. Mm, while in total pressure, it just depends upon um, what is your static pressure at a point and what your dynamic pressure is at a point and things like that. So yeah, that, that, that's just the uh, difference and we, we can uh, look more into it when we reach the aerodynamics concepts. Okay, sir, thank you. Any, any, any other comments or any questions that you guys want to ask? All right, uh, so if let me see if there's anything in the chat. Yeah, so I did. Um, discuss almost uh, what okay uh, so i think i covered almost everything that i wanted to cover for today so yeah thanks thanks guys um, and uh, feel free to ask any questions feel free uh, to to have any comments and you know approach um, me and what what about tomorrow's topics yeah tomorrow's topics is uh, uh, nothing but we'll go into manometers we'll talk about buoyancy uh, we will also go into fluid kinematics as well um, just to um, when fluid is actually moving, what how how to analyze it. So that that are the topics for tomorrow. All right. So thanks everyone. Have a good night. I'll see you guys tomorrow at the same time. Whether HL exam is easy or difficult, HL exam is like very easy compared to gate. You know, we if if this was a gate session going on, then uh, the questions that we would be solving would be much different and much difficult. Uh, so whatever the questions we saw over here are basically like you know you can just see and do it, right? I mean, you, you not you don't even have to write down anything, uh, but gate is definitely uh, more difficult. So do not do not be in fear of anything. Uh, I'm sure what are the concepts that we're covering over here will be more than enough to prepare you guys for the HL exam. And just that you just need okay, just need to make sure that you guys understand the concepts and ask questions and practice some very simple problems and you guys are good to go. All right. So yeah, thanks. Thank you guys. I'll see you guys tomorrow.